All right, well, welcome to this week's uh, Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium. Uh, we have a very exciting guest tonight um, and uh, very, very excited to start off uh, the Brain Tumor Awareness Month with a talk by Dr. Shah. Um, I encourage everybody to learn as much as they can about brain tumors and brain cancer this month in the month of May. Uh, I'm sure you're gonna see all over social media, uh, all that information. Um, just quick introductions as we get going. Uh, as you all know by now, the directors of our symposiums will be adding Dr. Shaw as soon as he starts. Uh, my name is Michael Ivan. I'm one of the neurosurgeons uh, here at the University of Miami. I'm joined by Dr. Komatar, Dr. Morkos, and Dr. Benjamin, who are all brain tumor specialists here at the Sylvester and University of Miami. Uh, each week we put on these symposiums. Um, they're all stored on YouTube and we couldn't do it without the help of all of our administrators. Christina, Ingrid, Roberto, Damari, and Ignacio, um, always stepping in, especially like tonight in the last minute, to help us uh, make this a successful endeavor. So thank you so much. Uh, for anybody who wants to learn more, you could always go to our social media or websites. Uh, we have many more um, pieces of information there about brain tumors as specifically that you can learn about. Um, I encourage you all to go to our YouTube channel where all of the um, brain tumor, skull-based, vascular, pediatric symposiums, and resident symposiums have all been stored um, where you could view them at any time. There's really a tremendous amount of knowledge there you should check out. Uh, so this week, uh, we're joined by, again, uh, a collection of University of Miami uh, fellows and research fellows from near and afar. Uh, Dr. Higgins is joining us um, here as a, as a surgical fellow uh, from Columbia. Dr. Patel is joining us from uh, Rutgers. Uh, they both uh, have just landed great uh, brain tumor jobs, and we're very, very excited for them to be uh, joining their practices in the next month. Uh, Martin uh, comes to us from Argentina. He's a research fellow with us now, uh, learning all about uh, brain tumors and, and doing some great work, and he's going to be joining our talk tonight, as well as uh, Dr. Morel, who's also a, a research fellow um, from Argentina, who's done some fantastic work here at the University of Miami. Uh, tonight, our special guest is Dr. Ashish Shah. Uh, Ashish is going to be joining our faculty in, in just a few days. Uh, we're super, super excited uh, that he's coming back here to Miami. Uh, he knows it well. He, he did his undergrad medical student, uh, medical school and residency here at the University of Miami. He did an infolded brain tumor fellowship and then left uh, where he's just finishing up now an outstanding year at the NIH in the surgical neurology branch and the uh, division of NINDS. Uh, where he's really doing some great work looking at uh, viral vectors and uh, immuno immunology in brain tumors. And so he's going to be joining us here. We're super excited. He's been tremendously productive thus far in his career, even though it's quite young with uh, or more than 125 papers, uh, NIH grants, uh, multiple other grants from NURF, and, and we, we only assume he's going to continue his greatness as he joins. So tonight he's going to be talking about uh, his passion and interest in brain tumors. And, and we thank him for, for tuning in from afar, but not for too much further, uh, Ashish Shah. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. That was a great introduction. And uh, obviously thank you to you and Rick for having me and all the support I've had at Miami. Those, they you know, kind of allowed me to do a lot of the work we're doing over here. Um, so, um, you know, today I thought I would give a little bit of more of a basic slash translational talk, uh, you know, to kind of change things up a little bit. Um, my talk is kind of focused on um, endogenous retroviruses and the landscape of uh, endogenous retroviruses in gliomas. Um, Mike, can you see the screen well? Yes. Yeah, we Perfect. can see everything good. Perfect. So, um, you know, uh, I've been doing a, a year here at the, in the NIH and IDS doing a, a clinical fellowship in, um, in neuro-oncology. And I kind of want to discuss a little bit of my passion here in endogenous retroviruses. So, uh, you know, glioblastoma, we're kind of all very familiar with this, you know, with the topic, um, you know, it, it being it's Brain Tumor Awareness Month in May, um, you know, we are all aware that, you know, we, we remove a glioma, we have radiation chemotherapy, which is the standard of care, and recurrence, unfortunately, is inevitable. Um, you know, most patients who have glioblastoma survive around 14 months, despite our maximal efforts. And so really, a shift in treatment is necessary. Um, and a lot of the translational work has really shifted over the last five to 10 years into kind of this idea of multiomics. So basically grabbing the tumor and trying to figure out what's the RNA transcriptome look like? What's the genome look like in the DNA? Well, what does the proteome look like? What are, you know, and so basically this whole idea of multiomics is really becoming a really big part of uh, 
of cancer care. And we're trying to integrate that into patient care and trying to decide uh, individual patient, patient treatments. Um, yet one of the most neglected kind of fields of multiomics is the idea of, um, you know, of uh, uh, basically the cancer virome. So the WHO estimates that nearly 10% of all cancers are linked to viruses. And these viral links to cancer are several ways. So in four main ways, they identify identification of viral DNA and tumor specimens. Sometimes these viruses can actually activate oncogenes and there's definitely viral and host gene modification. And so we're all very familiar with the viruses that cause cancer. Um, HPV is a very known one. We have a vaccine now out for it. Um, the basically hepatitis uh, virus, uh, you know, uh, can HPV, can HCV can cause uh, liver cancer, uh, gamma retroviruses and pancreatic cancer. Um, so there's been a lot of known, um, known risk factors for developing cancer with these viruses, but endogenous retroviruses have really been neglected in these large studies. Uh, now you ask yourself, what are endogenous retroviruses? Uh, well, it's exactly what the name means. Endogenous in your genes and retrovirus, meaning there's a retrovirus in your own genome. And roughly about 8% of our human genome is formed by these endogenous retroviral sequences, meaning that you can find viral elements in 8% of your genome. And they're characterized by these canonical sequences in our genome. So LTR, GAG, PAL, MV, these are the kind of sequences that characterize a retrovirus and they're integrated into our genome from millions and millions of years ago. And these, uh, you know, these uh, kind of genes have several several functions. You have the GAG, which is the capsid uh, protein, Paul, which is the reverse transcriptase, and envelope, which is a, which the which forms the envelope proteins. So these sequences all exist somewhere in our genome, about eight percent, and more or less, a lot of these don't retain many much function. Uh, and there are several reasons for that. Is that sometime um, during our evolutionary cycle, we uh, basically obtain different mutations and insertions and deletions of these viruses that make them relatively non-functional. Uh, and there are some functional viruses in our genome, but uh, they're largely re regulated by epigenetic factors such as um, methylation, uh, DNA methylation, histomethylation, and acetylation. So there's really these kind of epigenetic silencing of these retroviral elements that prevent these viral elements from being expressed because you, otherwise you'd ask yourself, why are, you know, why am I not producing viruses you know, right now? Uh, and the answer is uh, because you know, our body is basically suppressing them and there's a lot of genomic uh, you know, deletions and insertions. Um, and, but in cancer is a very unique kind of uh, um, disease in that a lot of, a lot of these epigenetic uh, factors are actually dysregulated. So in these systems, sometimes, uh, sometimes endogenous retroviruses can now be expressed and their proteins can also be expressed. So really, what does that mean uh, in, terms of, in terms of cancer care and cancer diagnosis? Uh, and this is why I wanna kind of talk, touch, you know, kind of shift base and talk a little bit about this topic about koalas. And I think this is really interesting. You might ask yourself, why are we talking about koalas in a brain tumor talk? Um, but uh, this story is quite fascinating. So um, koalas in uh, Australia are known to be having a higher cancer rate than uh, koalas in captivity. Uh, and currently in koalas, there's actually a, uh, um, an endogenization of a retrovirus called a core koala endogenous retrovirus that's actually occurring uh, as we speak. So over the last thousands of years, these, this retrovirus is now endogenizing in their genome and cancer rates are skyrocketing in the koalas. And so this paper was published about a few months ago, suggesting that these retroviral integrations may be responsible for these higher cancer rates in these koalas. So if you have time to read it, it's quite a fascinating read, but it's, it's kind of a, a real life um, endogenization going on as we speak. Um, you know, but what does that mean in terms of humans? So uh, if we go look at in, in, in different human cancers, such as breast, prostate, lymphoma, melanoma, there's been upregulation of these endogenous retroviral proteins, meaning that we have increased amounts of the envelope protein, reverse transcriptase has been found in breast cancer, colorectal cancer, lymphoma, melanoma. So you can see this kind of this pattern in a lot of different types of cancers. And you ask yourself, well, you know, what's really causing, you know, why are these proteins upregulating cancer and what are they doing? And so we did, a, we wrote a review on this about, about a year ago, looking and seeing whether, you know, what these proteins can actually do in the, in the, in the retrovirus. And, you know, these, these proteins can do a lot of different things. They can cause cell fusion. They can increase, um, you know, tumor genetic pathways such as uh, MYC and AKT. Uh, and uh, they can even cause cis activation of oct oncogenes. So meaning that some oncogenes can actually be activated by these uh, retroviral promoters. 
So a lot of different ways that these, these um, endogenous retroviral elements can actually promote cancer growth. And if you look at kidney cancer, for example, the expression, if you have high expression of endogenous retrovirus, your survival is much less compared to those that have low expression. However, not a lot of work has really been done in the field of gliomas. And we don't really know much about the endogenous retroviral landscape in gliomas. And so this has kind of been a passion of mine to look into this, to see whether or not we can kind of elucidate if it is over-regulated, upregulated in gliomas and see whether or not it is a reasonable target. Um, and if you look on PubMed, really the only data, you know, on this topic was, you know, from a paper about four or five years ago, suggesting that HERV-K RNA is expressed in about 15 to 20 percent of patients. And this is kind of a uh, kind of exploratory study, and they kind of looked at this from a, you know, a wide lens. Um, so a real, uh, a real in-depth look at the endogenous retroviral landscape in gliomas has really not been performed. And there's several reasons for that. Um, one is that glioblastoma is a very heter heterogeneous disease. We know that there's different subtypes of gliomas in each GBM. There's different cellular populations. The tumor sample purity may be affected. You may have certain areas of large necrosis that may affect your samples. Um, there's significant epigenetic dysregulation in these tumors. And to be quite frankly honest, the, our current RNA sequencing platforms or don't have enough reading depth to actually look at the entire retroviral landscape. So we have no idea what's going on in these, in, 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 with our current systems in terms of the endogenous retroviral expression. So, you know, we thought that maybe, why don't we take a kind of a exploratory look at endogenous retroviral expression in gliomas and see, you know, really what we can find out. Um, so we basically employed a custom, you know, kind of bioinformatic pipeline to kind of look at cell lines in glioblastoma and see whether or not we can see what the endogenous retroviral expression is in each one of these cell lines. And we can do that pretty easily by uh, grabbing uh, RNA sequencing data and looking at the HERV elements that are being expressed. Um, so we basically grabbed four different cell lines um, from normal astrocytes, which are kind of our normal control, all the way to A172, which is kind of the most aggressive kind of gl uh, glioblastoma cell line uh, that we had the uh, data for. And we basically looked at HERV expression uh, DNA methylation and localized exactly where the expression of these herbs are on the genes and seeing whether or not they can contribute to an oncogenic phenotype. So luckily, you know, at the NIH, we have the help of, you know, some expert bioinformaticians. Uh, Corey Johnson's here in the bioinformatics division and um, Veda, who I didn't have a picture of here, but he's one of our star medical students who's kind of helped out um, in this pipeline. So we employed this pipeline telescope to kind of look at the endogenous retroviral landscape in these cell lines. Um, and here's, you know, kind of our preliminary data showing that, you know, there is a, a high expression of HERV-K uh, in um, the most aggressive GBM cell line and the most, you know, the most indolent cell line, which is this H4 cell line, has a, has a very low expression of these endogenous retroviral expressions. And uh, this kind of got us thinking, well, is there kind of a link between HERV expression and cell aggressiveness? Uh, so this is a kind of a close-in look on the most aggressive cell line. You can see here that the very, there's one kind of element that's really highly expressed in the cell line, and this is list element HML6. And uh, that basically means it's uh, uh, from the HERV-K lineage. Uh, so kind of, kind of something we kind of expected, maybe this is a bad player, maybe this is you know, something contributing to um, you know, this cancer phenotype. And um, so we kind of wanted to look and see whether or not this is true. You know, this is a bioinformatic pipeline. And so you know, we're just doing this all on a computer. So what really, what does that mean? So we looked into this and we realized that this, this actual locus that was overexpressed actually is known to produce an envelope protein. So it was actually able to produce that envelope protein I was mentioning earlier that may you know, contribute to you know, um, this uh, increased uh, uh, tumor formation. And um, so uh, we know it's upregulated in the cell line and we know that it actually contains an open reading frame, meaning that this, this, uh, this transcript can actually be translated into a protein. And so, you know, we developed some primers to look at this, this, uh, this expression specifically. And you can see that our, our qPCR, you know, our in vitro validation shows that this, this locus was actually indeed overexpressed. This was just published maybe, I wanna say about two or three weeks ago, showing that the GBM cell lines have higher expression than astrocytes for the specific locus. And if you actually do uh, RNA in situ hybridization, meaning that you can actually look at the RNA transcripts under the microscope and see where they're expressed, 
you can see that this plentiful color red here, this is the GBM cell line showing the robust expression of this RNA compared to the controls here at the top. So this shows you that the transcripts are being expressed at high levels in glioblastoma uh, for this HML6, which is a endogenous retroviral element. And if you look at the TCGA curve, so now we're like, okay, well, what does this mean uh, from a clinical perspective? Patients that have higher expression of this transcript, of this specific uh, locus uh, on chromosome 19, have a much worse prognosis than patients who have low expression. So here, from, a, from an outside look in, if you have high expression of this HML6 transcript, you do much worse than patients who have low expression. And then you ask yourself, well, you know, we know that there's IDH wild type and IDH mutant, and we know that IDH mutant patients tend to do better. But if you look at the IDH wild type alone, this is also maintained. And so luckily, you know, we are allowed, we're lucky in the United States, we have the TCGA, but in China, they have the CCGA. So this is like a separate independent data set. And again, in the CCGA, this trend is also maintained. So this suggests that the uh, HML6 is an independent pr predictor of survival in uh, glioblastoma. And this is just looking at uh, um, uh, RNA-seq data from, from publicly available RNA-seq data. Interestingly, you know, the IDH mutant cell of patients had a lower expression of this HML6 and, um, and patients who had a co-deletion, uh, you know, our oligodendroglioma-like uh, patients had lower expression of HML6 as well. So that kind of trend was, uh, was maintained. And if you look at the different four subtypes um, uh, of GBM, the classical subtype tended to have the highest expression of HML6. So we're still trying to parse out really what that means. But interestingly, our cell lines, our patient-derived neurospheres, all were from the classical subtype. So I hope this kind of gives an idea that, you know, maybe there is some survival benefit, um, survival detriment to having higher expression of this HML6 transcript. And this kind of shows you that you can actually take something from a kind of in silico, in computer pipeline and kind of go through the levels of going from the, the cells to uh, kind of clinical, uh, uh, clinical parameters, see whether or not your, um, your target actually has some significance. So, you know, you ask yourself, well, why the, the IDH mutants patients, you know, had lower expression than the HM, than, than the wild type patients. So why is that? And if you may remember, the IDH mutant patients tend to have a really high uh, expression of DNA methylation. And, um, and this is really due to the IDH mutation and kind of the pathogenesis of the IDH mutant gliomas. But what really makes them, you know, uh, makes, them pro makes them significant is they have this hypermethylator phenotype. So... So then we ask ourselves, does the epigenetic landscape in these gliomas really influence HERV expression? So, um, you know, when you look at the amount of methylation in gliomas compared to other IDH mutant tumors, the amount that's methylated in gliomas is significantly higher than other tumors such as AML, melanoma, and cholangiocarcinoma. So this really kind of gives us an idea that the epigenetic uh, dysregulation in gliomas really may play a role in HERV expression. And as I mentioned, you know, there's these three genes here that really regulate HERV expression. One of them is SETDV1, which is a histone methyltransferase. The other one is this NP220, which is a zinc finger. And the other one is called a HUSH complex. Um, and this is called HUSH um, because it really silences, uh, you know, uh, endogenous retrovirus. It's kind of a cute name. But, it, you know, these, this, this complex, you know, we, we kind of call this the retroviral silencing complex, but this really works on silencing HERV expression. So, you know, we ask ourselves, well, what does this have to do uh, with GBM? So if you take all these genes in the retroviral silencing complex and you put them into uh, a, a heat map, you can actually see that the highest expression of these, uh, of the retroviral silencing complex seems to be clustering all together. See here, the patients in red, are all clustering together and the patients with low expression are all kind of clustering together. And as you expect, the higher expression of the retroviral silencing complex, um, patients did much better than the patients who had low expression, meaning that if you had higher HERV expression, you did worse than patients who had low HERV expression. So, you know, this is kind of a surrogate we're looking at, you know, looking at this data. And interestingly, the, the, you know, this is now clustering by methylation. So the, you know, the more methylated the patients were, you can see the higher of the retro of the of the expression of the silencing complex. So, more DNA methylation, less HERV expression, uh, and higher retroviral silencing complex. So that's kind of the the you know the kind of meaning here. And uh, this kind of gives you an idea that maybe this is a predictor of overall survival in gliomas. 
So again, here, this kind of shows you again, you look at an IDH mutant patient, you can see a low expression of uh, this is a green here is an uh, endogenous retroviral uh, envelope protein. Uh, you can see a low expression of this envelope protein in, in the low grade glioma. And in, in high grade glioma, you can see much higher expression of this protein. Um, and so this, is, this correlates to DNA methylation as well. So I'm gonna kind of switch talks, uh, switch topics a little bit, switch away from HML6 to uh, kind of a known uh, kind of um, proto-oncogene uh, per se, a HERV-K, which is, um, you know, the most, the most recently integrated one is called HML2. Uh, and this is the one that's gonna study the most in other types of cancer. So we thought we'd look, look into this a little bit more to see if whether or not it has a role in glioma. So, you know, as I mentioned to you, um, you know, these, these endogenous retroviral sequences exist in our genome. Um, but they're not really, they don't really make proteins a lot of the time. Um, but interestingly, the HML2 sequence specifically actually forms, uh, forms retroviral proteins in these dysregulated states. And these proteins, this, you know, envelope protein or this, or the splice products, REC and MP9 can actually, you know, uh, predispose um, patients to tumor formation. So a lot of research has been done in a lot of types of cancers in HML2 specifically, but not a lot has been done in gliomas. So we sought to kind of investigate what its role is in gliomas and what we can do about it. Um, so, you know, in our review, we noticed a lot of different elements, which could be, which her HML2 can kind of play a role on in terms of being an oncogenic driver. And then, so we sought to said, okay, well, you know, is this being expressed, HML2, is it being expressed as a protein, meaning the envelope protein, is it being expressed in our cells? So you can see in her astrocytes here with relatively no expression of this protein. And you can go up and see like, you know, certain patients, certain patient derived cell lines, HML2 um, is highly expressed uh, and other cell lines a little bit less. Now the bottom here is basically uh, RNA in situ hybridization, basically showing you the different RNA transcripts that are being overexpressed. This is a closer view. Now you can see here the red is HML6, the one we just talked about, and green is HML2. So this one, this this specific, these specific stem cells actually have uh, both endogenous retroviral elements being expressed. And so here you can see difference between two different patient-derived uh, glioma cells. One is HML2 predominant, morally green and another one that's HML6 predominant, more red. So, okay, that's great. You know, you say this is nice, you show this exists in cells, but really does it exist in patients? So I, I haven't really proven that to you, so let's see if I can. So um, this is basically epilepsy tissue. Again, really no uh, HERFK expression. And when you go to, uh, you know, these high-grade gliomas, you can see robust HML2 expression. Here's the yellow here, and you can see this kind of zoomed in yellow kind of forming in the cytoplasm, going around in the plasma membrane um, with robust envelope expression in these patient, uh, in, this, uh, in this patient sample. This is a 70 year old male with this uh, kind of frontal GBM. Uh, the tumor was removed. You can see the areas that are really highly expressed with uh, HERV-K. However, not all patients have HERV-K expression. Here's another patient who has really no HERV-K expression in the sample that we biopsy. But if you take a look at, you know, you know most patients, you can see some evidence of HERFK expression in these patients. So here is a panel of just six different patients. You can see basically heterogeneous expression of HERFK. HERFK here is in yellow, and you can see that it's really expressed in different areas of cells and really depends on the cellular state uh, in terms of its uh, uh, HERFK expression. And if you take the CSF around the tumor, you can see that the glioma specimens actually have much higher expression of HERFK RNA compared to the epilepsy controls. And the same uh, kind of um, the same thing is seen in tumor specimens, except to a higher extent um, in um, uh, when you take the tumor RNA as well. So, really, does you ask yourself the next question? Does this, you know, does HML2 have a functional role in GBM? So, this was a paper kind of published by uh, our group uh, in 2015. Sorry, 2020, I think, that basically suggested that. The HERFK was essential for stem cell function and neuronal differentiation. So essentially, this showed that neurons that were in a deep differentiated state had higher HERFK expression. And when you silence that HERFK expression, the, they tended to differentiate. Um, so this kind of gives the idea, well, maybe HML2 is really necessary for the maintenance of stemness. And this wasn't the first time really that this had been proposed. If you look, you know, there's some data um, in about, I think this was published in 2015 in Nature, but basically in the blastocyst formation. So essentially when our embryos are forming and they're in the blastocyst stage, you may remember this is the eight cell kind of stage. 
you can actually find endogenous retroviral proteins being expressed. And here you can see in panel D, there's actually the, the viral protein is being um, budded off the plasma membrane in the, uh, in, uh, in the embryo. So this is kind of suggesting that in the, stem, in the most stem cell state, the HERV elements are expressed the most. And if you remember um, the genes for syncytion one and two, which are kind of important for placental and trophoblast development, those are actually endogenous retroviral proteins. So that's actually from the HERV W pathway. It's not HERV K, but HERV W. So this is kind of proof that proof in the pudding kind of demonstrating that the HML2 is really necessary for maintenance of stemness uh, in, in, in our normal um, development. Now in cancer, you know, this idea has been described in melanoma, um, it's been described in breast cancer, but really not a lot has been done in glioma. So, in, you know, in cancer, there's a lot of different um, ideas that are being thrown around about the, about how HERP-K contributes to stemness. So um, there's some suggestion that if there, it's required for CD133 presentation, it's required for self-renewal. Um, uh, HERP-K actually promotes immune escape and actually downregulates MHC classes. Um, for metastasis, there's, a, there's a, some data suggests that it actually promotes um, invasion and drug resistance. So this is all kind of giving us an idea that this is really important for, you know, these cancer stem cell states and whether or not this could be a target in glioma really has to be determined. So that kind of became, as you can imagine, that's our next question is, can we target, you know, this aberrant expression of HERV-K? And if we can target it, you know, how can we target it? So. So if you look at our glioma patient samples, so this is a IDH wild type glioma here, and you know, we stained it for you know basically eleven different proteins. So you know I was fat, fortunate that one of our uh, one of the uh, pathologists here at the NIH was able to basically stain samples with eleven different proteins simultaneously, and you know you're able to see here that there's a stem cell niche in the sample. So see this yellow here is a stem cell niche, and this area is. Predomin predominantly expresses HERV-K. So the, you know, here we're staying for HERV-K, OCT4, which is a nuclear transcription factor, uh, SOX2, nested, and Vimentin. And you can see the areas that localize with all these proteins have a robust expression of HERV-K. Um, and this is kind of a close-in showing you that uh, this is you know, the co-localization of these stem cell markers in these, HER in these HERV-K positive areas. And we actually quantified all of this expression and they seem to co-localize pretty well in these patient samples. So then that kind of gets us the next clue. Okay, well, in patient samples, the stem cell niche is, is maybe it has high HERV-K expression. So you ask yourself, can we really target a HERV-K expression in GBM? So, uh, you know, I was fortunate that when I joined the lab, uh, one of the other postdoctorates in the lab, Tara, actually cre created a CRISPR-DCAS9 uh, construct that, that can allosterically inhibit the HERV-K LTR or the promoter for uh, HML2. Uh, this was validated in ATRT cell lines, um, uh, in, um, and this was published in scientific reports previously. Uh, so I decided to try to use this uh, plasmid to try to target um, the HERV-K LTR in gliomas. Um, and so when we targeted our, our, the HERV-K LTR, we actually dramatically shifted uh, the amount of apoptotic cells and increased the apoptosis in these glioblastoma neurospheres. Additionally, we then decided to do a neurosphere formation assay to just whether or not to see if these gliomas maintain their ability to self-renew. So essentially we take, you know, plasmid that didn't have the, the CRISPR construct and plasmids that did have the CRISPR construct. We transfected both the cells and the cells that actually were knocked down for HERV-K had completely reduced neurosphere formation compared to those that uh, did not. So this is, you know, statistically significant. Two different patient-derived cell, um, patient-derived uh, cell lines, suggesting that HML2 is really important for the cell renewal capacity of these glioma neurospheres. So then we thought, okay, well, you know, are we really bringing down the HERF-K uh, transcript? So here's, you know, here's RNA scope again, RNA in situ hybridization. These little dots here are the RNA transcripts, and you can see when you treat them with this, you know, with the guiding, you know, plasmid towards the HERF-K uh, LTR, you actually reduced the amount of um, RNA transcript significantly of both OCT4, HERF-K, and Nestin. So now we have cells that have reduced stem cell transcripts, uh, both by qPCR and RNA scope, suggesting that, uh, that the, the HERF-K reduces stemness in these cells. So then our next question was, okay, can we knock down um, 
you know, HERFK expression in mice and does it actually promote survival? So we basically took our plasmids and said, okay, can we bring down the HERFK expression by transfecting these cells with, uh, with this CRISPR construct? Uh, we nuclear affected them, so we needed them to kind of, you know, you know, basically recover for a few days, and then and then inject those cells into the brains of these mice, um, you know, and see whether or not uh, um, tumors develop and see how long they survive. Um, this is really important because this is a transient transfection, meaning that we were giving the plasma to certain cells, and certain cells will stop producing HERFK uh, transcripts, but. Um, you know, it's not for, it doesn't last beyond certain replication cycles. So, um, so it's really kind of important to know as we kind of look at our data. So you can see here that the non-guiding tumors, so the, the controls develop substantially large tumors while the guiding ones develop smaller tumors, but, and, and had an improvement in survival. So median overall survival was improved by about seven to 10 days in our, in our treatment group, suggesting that HERP-K LTR was a really good target. Um, uh, in these mice. Uh, now you might ask yourself, well, you know, the tumor is still developed, there's not a cure. But remember I said, this is a transient transfection, meaning we did not transfect all the cells, only like 40 to 50% of the cells were actually transfected with our plasmids. So you can imagine if we created a stable knockdown or a, cons or a consistent target for this, we'd actually see a much more robust, um, you know, um, uh, survival benefit. Additionally, the tumors that all formed in both the controls and the treatment all were very highly positive for HERFK. So here you can see green is HERFK. So this suggests that the HERFK expression in these um, cells was extremely high. And those tumors that formed were all, all cells that really were resistant to the transfection. So if we find a way to stably target this HERFK um, protein, we may actually have uh, 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 more of a uh, survival benefit. So this is kind of showing us that, you know, there are you know, some limitations to our model, but certainly some things we can definitely address. So, you know, the next thing is whether or not, you know, HERFK can really be a biomarker. And, you know, you know this is a virus. So you, you ask yourself, oh, is, it, is that there actual viral production happening in these glioblastoma cells? Something else going on? So, um, so HERFK is actually an extracellular marker. Uh, and so you know, Tara, one of my colleagues actually demonstrated this in her paper in scientific reports showing that in ATRT, you can actually see budding of these endogenous retroviral proteins uh, in, the, in different cells. And in our glioblastoma cells, you can actually see evidence of the envelope protein in the supernatant, in, in, uh, in, in the supernatant of, these, of the cells. So this is suggesting that this is, there's active export of these proteins uh, and there's really none in the astrocyte controls. So if we did electron microscopy, you know, here you can see this is the nucleus here, this dense area here. And you can see these little dots here are basically the HERFK envelope protein kind of going into the Golgi and cytoplasm. And you can see from the Golgi and cytoplasm, it starts to kind of escape and go into these little microvilli processes. Here's one of these microvilli processes. And you can see the protein, you know, really wanting to escape from the uh, plasma membrane. So this is suggesting that there is active export of this protein uh, in GBM neurospheres. And so this is, this is kind of proof in the pudding that we may, you know, maybe a good target here um, and maybe a good biomarker as well. So then we said, okay, well, you know, is, can we use HERFK proteins as a biomarker in glioblastoma? So this is, you know, this is the idea that, you know, these cells are making reverse transcriptase uh, in breast cancer. It's been shown that reverse transcriptase levels were higher in breast cancer patients compared to normal patients. And that even if you had a high a grade aggressive uh, breast cancer, your reverse transcriptase levels were much higher than uh, patients with a low grade uh, you know, breast cancer. So this was a prognostic marker in, in breast cancer. So the question is, can this be a prognostic marker really in glioblastoma? Uh, and this really comes, comes down to the fact that there is this, you know, Paul gene in the middle of the, um, in the middle of the uh, uh, HERFK gene sequences that actually codes for a reverse transcriptase. So then we sat down and looked at our cell lines and, and did something called a PERT assay, which is a you know, product enhanced reverse transcriptase assay. And uh, really this kind of helps us decide, you know, uh, whether or not there is reverse transcriptase activity packaged into the extracellular vesicles of uh, different retroviruses. And so here you can see that these cells, the neurosphere stem-like cells had a much higher expression 
of reverse transcriptase compared to the kind of control A172 cells, which uh, remember A172 had a, had a high expression of HTML6, but not high expression of the um, of her of HTML2, which is the one we're discussing now. So this kind of gives proof of concept that maybe there is higher reverse transcriptase levels in these cells, and maybe if there's higher reverse transcriptase levels, you can target this. Uh, so this was a paper that was published about five years ago by our group in retrovirology. Um, this kind of suggested that HERVK could be inhibited by antiretroviral drugs. So you can imagine these cells are producing uh, in, uh, retro, uh, retroviral proteins, one of them being uh, reverse transcriptase. So can you use reverse transcriptase inhibitors to target these cells? Uh, and so here they show that increasing concentrations of these reverse transcriptase inhibitors actually inhibited the uh, HERVK uh, production in different cell lines. And one of the most significant uh, inhibitors were these kind of uh, NRTIs or nucleoside reverse, transcri reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And one of those, if you remember from medical school, is this one, abecavir. So abecavir can actually inhibit uh, HERVK polymerase genes significantly and seems to be a good target. So we sat down and saw whether or not you know, abecavir can actually inhibit GBM viability. So by treating these cells with abecavir, uh, you can see that it actually reduced cell viability of these cells quite a bit um, in several different cell lines. And this was independent of temozolomide, meaning that these cells were treated with temozolomide or without temozolomide, and the cells died with the abecavir treatment regardless. Um, interestingly, someone's done a similar study in medulloblastoma, and our IC50s are much less in uh, glioblastoma. So this is suggesting that may be a good uh, uh, area for drug repurposing. And then when you treat these cells with like a sub-therapeutic dosing of abecavir, meaning that you're treating them with much less, uh, you know, abecavir than, than, uh, than, than kills the cells, you actually have a reduction of the HERVK envelope protein and OCT4. So you're basically reducing the stem cell markers in these cells with reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So this is, you know, this is kind of proof that, okay, we have high expression of HERVK proteins in these cells. These cells um, produce reverse transcriptase. We inhibit the cell, the inhibit the reverse transcriptase with the becavir, and we basically reduce the stem stemness of these cells as well. So this is, you know, that kind of, uh, now they were talking about me, now we're talking more about translation, the idea of bringing some of these uh, treatments now into um, uh, these treatments for, uh, for potential translation. So, you know, there are several future directions now we can talk about. Um, so one is we can basically define the retrotranscriptome a little bit more. So if you remember, uh, I kind of showed a lot of data on our cells and showed in you know, the RNA sequencing on our cells and saw how that kind of played out. But we can really define the define larger data sets um, beyond TCGA and seeing whether or not which herb elements are mostly or more highly expressed in certain subgroups and whether or not we can cluster patients uh, based on their retrotranscriptome, meaning that they're HERV elements, and seeing whether or not um, you know that has actually shows some prognostic markers. Um, there's definitely some ways we can improve targeting of HERVK envelope and gliomas. There's several ideas that we're kind of thinking about um, to target HERVK envelope. So whether that be reverse transcriptase inhibitors or antisense oligonucleotides or um, you know CAR T cells, there's a lot of different options that we can use to target HERVKs in gliomas. Um, and the next thing is kind of defining retroviral biomarkers. So, you know, I showed you earlier that the uh, reverse transcriptase levels were higher in uh, glioma neurospheres. So, it, you know, the question is, are they, are, you know, can we do the same thing, in, you know, in the tumor microenvironment, see whether or not reverse transcriptase levels are higher there? Uh, and, you know, do they come down after the tumor has gone away? Can, can this be a non-invasive biomarker of disease? So this is, you know, a whole, a whole slew of different questions we can come up with. Um, you know, so, you know, for the sake of time and for this, you know, to avoid, you know, boring you all, I kind of uh, wanted to stop a little short uh, here to kind of leave time for questions. Um, and, uh, um, you know, this is a little plug for my lab. We're starting this lab uh, coming up in um, July. Um, uh, this, this lab will be focused on cancer virology and immunotherapy. Um, we'd love for you if you're interested in science, interested in uh, virotherapy, 
uh, and endogenous retroviruses. Uh, if you want to come join our lab, if you're interested in lab work, we'd love to have you. Um, where it's going to be a fun kind of experience. So, uh, and I'm also thankful to Mike because he's right next door to us, and uh, so he's been a tr um, tremendous mentor in that sense. So, we're um, looking forward to doing that together. Um, there's a lot of people in the uh, in Avi's lab. This is uh, Dr. Knott's lab, uh, who's my main mentor here at the NIH. Uh, so I have to give him a lot of thanks for the opportunities that I've been given this year. Um, uh, two postdocs, uh, Tara and Katie, have been instrumental in teaching me. You know, as a neurosurgeon, you're not necessarily that savvy with basic science, but uh, I've been really lucky to have all their support. Uh, in our SNB lab, uh, Sarah uh, is one of our post uh, postback students who's been extremely helpful with a lot of the assays uh, that I showed you here today. Um, and then on the UM side, Avedia, who's an upcoming medical student, who's a medical student's upcoming neurosurgery resident, actually, um, has helped out a lot with our transcriptomic analysis. Um, I didn't show some of that transcriptomic analysis today, but um, hopefully another time I can kind of join you guys and sh you know, share with you what we're kind of finding. Um, and of course, my mentors um, at the NIH, John Heiss, uh, Avinath, and Mark Gilbert. So um, thank you again. I hope we open up to questions if there are any, and uh, we can have a discussion. Um. I think I think uh, Mike uh, had to step out just for a second. Br, Sheesh, that was a phenomenal talk. Um, that was really really good. Oh, no, uh, appreciate it. No, it was, uh, really, I I think it was about you know sort of for me, obviously not really having a grip on some of these you know some of these sort of endogenous retrovirus concepts. It was really cool to see that. And clearly, you've kept very busy at the NIH for the year. That's kind of awesome to see. And, um, you know, obviously UM's become a home for, for me too. So uh, it's exciting for you to see, you know, bring this back to UM. Um, question for you, and then we'll sort of go into questions from uh, our other panelists and the audience. Uh, on that note, I do encourage the audience to, you know, post any questions you may have in the chat. And so after our panel started, I'll bring them up. But Ashish, um, you know, one of the things that I had sort of, I guess, uh, in, in sort of the prior work I've seen for like intra arterial chemotherapy, some of the older work, is, you know, they talk about the perivascular stem cell niche. And, you know, you kind of touched upon the stem cell niche in, in your slides. Um, and do you feel that there could be an intra arterial or, or some sort of a route like that where you could sort of use for delivery of some of the therapies you talked about or potential therapies, I should say? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a good question because, you know, obviously for neurosurgeons, the delivery is like, you know, the number one question. Uh, luckily for these antiretrovirals, since, you know, in the HIV patients, they want to get good, um, good uh, blood brain barrier penetration, um, you know, they, you know, a lot of these penetrate the blood are very, pretty good. And they've actually have good data to suggest that they're able to, you know, get in, get into the CSF pretty well. Um, now the question is, do they get to the, get, do they get into the parenchyma, right? Um, so it would be nice to actually, you know, do these kind of phase zero studies where you're able to take a piece of the tumor after, after treatment and seeing whether or not it penetrates. Uh, intra-arterial would be a, definitely an option, but the question is how many times would you have to give intra-arterial? You know, giving it once may not be good enough. You may have to give it, you know, six, seven times, you know, so, you know, having a steady state, I think is really important to kind of prevent, you know, these yeah. cancers, keep these cancer stem cells at bay. So um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think a lot of different options. I'm, I'm interested in the CSF delivery route, you know, you know, I think Omayas are great if you can use them. And Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, steady state from the Maya standpoint, it definitely makes sense to uh, constant access point. Um, or even like a smart shunt system in cases of like, you know, uh, in case we have hydrocephalus and you can connect with the tumor or something like that. Um, I guess we can go to our next panelist. Uh, Alexis, any questions from you? Yes, uh, great, <laughs> great, great talk, Ashish. I mean, I was, I was I'm definitely impressed. I mean, great job in there. So um, my question is, I mean, we have seen many research projects actually using glioma cell lines and citing treatments. That seem very promising in paper, but they fail once we test those treatments to real patients. Do you think that herbs play a role in this like phenomenon? I mean, I see that you address some of these issues in your model showing a high expression of HRK, but are, what are your general thoughts on these common limitations when using cell lines? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, using these cell lines is really difficult. You know, we're, you know, we're using like you know three to four different cell lines. You know, I mean, if you're if you're if you really want to see whether or not there is an effect, you have to get, you know, six, seven, eight cell lines from different, you know, different types of subtypes, and then, you know, really validate that into a, you know, a mice model. Um, and then, you know, the other question we had for ourselves is, you know, is it really expressed a lot in our GVM patients? So, you know, that's what we took, like, you know, 
10, 14 patients and like stain them for HERF-K to see whether or not they're, you know, it was expressed. And, you know, we did find HERF-K expression, but not in all of them, right? So cer certain patients, you know, and maybe we're not biopsying the stem cell areas. Maybe we're biopsying the proliferative areas that aren't, you know, the stem cell areas. So, you know, that's, that may be contributing to why there's this heterogeneous expression. And do I think it's going to be like a cure-all that, you know, you get rid of this and it's gone? No, I don't think so. But I think that it's a step that maybe after resection, and chemotherapy radiation, we know that the cells that are responsible for recurrence are these stem-like progenitor cells that shift, that become, that mutate and, you know, go in different directions and, you know, really escape, you know, escape our treatments. As neurosurgeons, it's very frustrating. So if we can target these cells, if we can identify these cells, then, you know, we're like, you know, a step ahead. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, definitely a good point from Alexis. Um, we have uh, Martin here as well, uh, who's one of our visiting neurosurgeons from Argentina. Nice. We, uh, we had a nice discussion in Philly. Yeah, he's been, Martin, it's been wonderful having you here. Uh, so, you know, it's a pleasure to work with you and see you every day. Any questions for, uh, for Ashish? Yeah, hi. Uh, well, very, very interesting talk. Uh, very interesting subject. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, the hurricane may be a prognostic uh, marker, right? Uh, I was wondering, um, has it been studied like the interaction with IDH status uh, by means uh, like th thinking of a future algorithm? I I've seen you, you've compared like the uh, sur survivals, but I don't know like if, if yeah, well, if, has it been, have, have you seen any kind of interaction with, with, uh, with the mutation? Yeah, I mean, I think that that initial data from the HTML6 paper that we published showed that the IDH mutant patients had lower expression of, of some of these retroviral proteins. And I may have kind of gone through it pretty fast because I thought it would kind of bore everybody, but uh, the, you know, these, the, the patients that have the highest methylation, so these IDH mutant patients, if you look at their, their, epigen their epigenome, I guess if you say, um, they, you know, they actually have a lot of methylated areas. And um, that actually, what we think, contributes to lower HERV expression in the IDH mutant patients. Um, and so is there, you know, is there a link between why these patients do better, you know, because maybe they have lower HERV expression, you know, who knows? Um, and so I think that that's kind of an important, interesting point. Um, it'd be interesting to look at this from an unbiased perspective and seeing whether or not, you know, IDH mutant patients, you know, who have high HERV expression versus IDH mutant patients that have low HERV expression and seeing, you know, how they, how they look, you know, in terms of survival. Um, so a lot of, you know, a lot of questions that, you know, we have to ask ourselves, <laughs> but I, I do think, I do think the, your point in terms of the mutations are important because these mutations really can change the, you know, the epigenetic landscape of, of, of these tumors and, um, you know, certain loci become hypermethylated and then the herb expression, you know, goes down. Um, so, um, it's it, it, it's quite interesting um, in that sense. I, I don't know if you're if you're familiar with the kind of you know the CIMP status in gliomas at all, or you know there's uh, there's these you know IDH mutant patients have kind of two different groups. And they really kind of split them up into CIMP, which is like a hypermethylator high group, and a high uh, and CIMP low, which is you know this is, you know they're basically referring to the amount of methylated you know CPG islands on these tumors and the low. The, met, the low methylated patients actually do much worse than the high methylated patients. So now you're now distinguishing in little subtypes of these mutated patients about which ones do worse and which ones do better. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot to do in the cancer epigenetics in that field. Um, and I think there's a nice interplay, uh, at least with us. So, All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, no let me see if there's any questions from our chat. Give me one second, Ashish. Uh, somebody asked if you can post your email address up again, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. No problem. So there it is right there. So for anyone who's missed that, there it is, you know, obviously reach out. The, the UM team is always happy to have people to help out and join. Um, any other questions from any panelists, um, any sort of chat members or anything like that? I'm just seeing... Okay, I have one here, um, an anonymous attendee. Uh, could you speculate on the functional role of the envelope protein product of HML6? Yeah, I think that's great. That's a really good question. Um, and thank you for asking that. Um, so uh, 
you know, the um, basically HTML6, uh, you know, if I'll, I'll go back to the slide, if I can show it, hold on one second. HTML6 codes for a envelope protein, but specifically that area of um, the envelope was actually this, uh, this protein called REC, which is a splice product. So, you know, this envelope protein in certain areas, they can actually get split into this splice products, which is REC and MP9. And this REC protein actually is a RNA export protein. So it actually takes RNA, it takes specifically like, you know, in HIV, they call it, you know, they, you know, they have different names like Rex and Rev. Um, and so the, in HIV, the Rev protein actually takes the viral RNA and takes it out of the nucleus for, you know, for transcription. So this, this protein actually may be responsible for taking viral elements and, you know, allowing and promoting expression. So we, you know, we don't know that yet, um, but it's certainly a good, a good, um, a good thought of maybe what it does. So um, that's a very nice question, actually. That's great. Uh, I think that's it from a question standpoint. Um, well, Shish, thank you so much. That was a really yeah. awesome talk. Um, you know, of course, it's always great to have family back on, uh, you know, <laughs> ZBTS. Um, we'll be back on next month, uh, the first week of June, for all of our listeners. Um, you know, stay tuned for our presenter and topic along with our link. Um, and uh, with that, I'll say good night to everyone. And thank you to the panelists. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.